evening everyone and welcome to the panel discussion on marketing and selling strategies in turbulent times this panel discussion has been organized by isb center for business markets also referred to as isb cbm the center provides a platform for collaboration between industry and academia the mandate for the center is to get research output which is focused on practice and also conduct workshops on topics relevant to marketing and sales i'd like to uh, introduce our first speaker professor arunachalam who is the assistant professor of marketing at isb his research and teaching interests are in strategic marketing issues he has published in top marketing general, journals he is the youngest professor to have been awarded the professor of the year twice for the flagship pgp program in the years 2019 and 2020 professor arunachalam is also the director for the center of innovation and entrepreneurship at isb our second speaker today is ms anandita banik who is the founder and ceo at smart winner a global enterprise sales enablement platform anandita has 18 years of experience in the field of technology and consulting before founding smart winner she worked with accenture and tcs in their global consulting practice and has worked in usa uk australia and india and our third speaker today is mr shiladit malik who is the chief business office officer at smart winner is an isb mba shiladit has 17 years of experience in consultative selling and pnl responsibility before joining smart winner he was heading the international business for isb executive education so over to our uh, today to take the panel discussion forward thank you asta uh, thank you very much to cbm uh, good evening to one and all uh, thank you for taking the time on a friday evening uh, before i start i want to make a very important uh, point it's such a honor to have uh, anindita here because she is one of the very few uh, successful female entrepreneurs in the saas software as a service space So thank you, Anindita. It's such a honor and joy to have you here. Of course, along with uh, Shiladita Malik, uh, I will jump straight into the bandwidth of your time. Now, uh, the agenda for the day is uh, going to be the following. So I'll speak for about fifteen twenty minutes on the importance of uh, what type of marketing strategies make sense and how to effectively use them in such uh, pandemic situations. I'll be touching upon. Uh, specifically on digital uh, social media aspects on the first uh, two three slides next i will move on to how uh, customers and brands uh, react during this pandemic uh, what can be effectively done then i will hand over uh, the presentation to uh, mr shiladita malik uh, we actually read uh, lots of questions which have been raised so we want to make sure the presentation is somewhat prescriptive in nature but at, at the same time we cannot keep it completely prescriptive uh, because uh, uh, some of you might find it too provocative so we will tread the uh, tread a balance with caution shiladitya will touch upon specifically an important aspect of virtual selling uh, from his rich experience uh, uh, of business as well as running smart winner and then we'll move on to anindita where she is going to talk specifically about a particular use case and how uh, digital interventions actually helped solve a problem for that company uh, so that's the agenda for today so uh, let me just get started initially uh, <clears throat> all right when we talk of any type of economic recession uh, but this covid pandemic is not just a economic recession alone it's kind of a health hazard as well so there is uh, health uh, issues also uh, involved here the first axe which normally falls uh, during any type of recession is on something called marketing budget now what do you do now uh, should i spend on marketing or should i uh, cut it off completely or how do i uh, balance the marketing aspect of it so i'm jumping straight into the topic no no need of any other fara farni liye here and towards the end we will get into questions so uh, some of the prime reason uh, if i ask you a poll here many of you would be saying that it is better to completely scrap it off initially or reduce it at least by let's say 70% or so uh, we should focus on getting top line as much as possible marketing is mostly like a cost center for now it's very very clear and evident therefore advertisement budgets uh, uh, promotional budgets etc needs to go down that would be some of the uh, straightforward and understandable reasons which uh, top managements normally give 
But what research shows is slightly counterintuitive. Now, what do we do in terms of recession times? The first critical message is the following. Do not completely scrap off your marketing budget. It is okay to reduce your marketing budget, but there are lots of research in marketing and also in some economics journals. And these type of research normally falls under the larger umbrella of what is called business cycle. That is, you go through a cycle of upward trend in business and then some kind of an exogenous recession hits you. So you fall down and then you climb up again. So in these type of cyclical business and socio-political moments, what has research told us about marketing actions? The message is very, very clear. Do not scrap off marketing budget. Try to reduce particularly the advertisement budget. In fact, there are some powerful research which are empirically driven. That is database evidence which says that invest even in R&D developments as well. That's the first upshot and the key takeaway. Now, there are some lots of good news here, and I'm going to share some database stuff which can be immediately taken back and put to use uh, quite instantly. And we've seen companies which have been doing it. As I told you initially, I'm going to jump into the technology or digital aspects of things for the decision for today. So in terms of digital, uh, the good news is the following. The cost per thousand, which is the CPM, has fallen down by 50%. Yes, I repeat, by 50%. Let me show you evidence. The Facebook ads, if you notice, uh, this graph is having x-axis is the timeline. So uh, I'm just catching on to the time of during the recession hit, which is primarily in the first week of March. And if you notice, starting from the first week of March, the amount of money which Facebook is requesting you to pay for a thousand impressions has gone down within about two weeks or three weeks by 50%. That is, even if you reduce by digital marketing spend by 50%, you can actually get same number of impressions with 50% reduced marketing budget. It's not just Facebook alone. Instagram also reduced at the same time around 40%. If you go and check other social media in business space as well, let's say LinkedIn or other places, I'm pretty sure we have similar numbers where companies, social media partners and agencies are trying to bring down the cost to make sure that customers try to use the social media platforms in a much more aggressive manner during pandemic times. Now, what is the good news, even better news, is the following. So I am putting both the graph of Facebook and Instagram's impression. This is not the cost per thousand. This is the impression growth which has happened during the time period. It's a staggering 100% growth. Just about from March 10th till March 24th, both Instagram and Facebook observed and documented that the amount of impressions which has come year on year is 100% during the recession time. Now, what does it say? The key takeaway is that even if you reduce your marketing budget, particularly the digital spends by close to say 50%, you actually are gaining much more than during the normal times where you would have been intended to spend about 100% of the marketing budget to gain this much of, uh, let's say, impressions growth. Therefore, in terms of digital interventions, so you do have a lot of support and companies like Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram are coming to your help. Please use them smartly. <laughs> Next. Now, jumping straight into the social media aspect, there is very interesting research which is coming in very recently that uh, people are beginning to use social media more aggressively. The reason is straightforward. Why? We can quickly adapt and reach the quarantine customers, whether it is business customers or B2C consumers. And evidence is that marketing budgets for social media have gone up from let's say 10 to 12% to 23% in just May alone. Where do I get, source these numbers from? These are numbers from a very interesting survey called CMO survey, which is done by a Duke University professor. Not only the increase in social media is seen, but that increase in social media spend 
is actually causing a positive lift in the performance outcome of the firms which have used this social media. So the performance metric could be as simple as top line sales or slightly more sophisticated as let's say customer retention or yield of customer management. And we will show what metrics can be tracked in the future. So the key takeaway from this slide is that social media helps during this pandemic times and there are companies which have reported a positive lift. So what do these companies do right in terms of managing the social media? I say there are three things which these companies do right in making sure the social media gives the intended positive outcomes. First and foremost is partnership. It's very, very important that you as a company needs to identify the social media agency and develop in-depth relationship with them. This business relationship is going to be the future. If not for the future, for now, this is going to be absolutely important. In fact, there is evidence that the amount of outsourcing of social media activities which companies have done has gone as high as 25 percentage in the last three months alone after the pandemic hits. And I really love this quote, which uh, a senior Deloitte manager has just mentioned, is that it's absolutely important to develop a trusted agency client relationship between your company and a social media agency. I will try to unpack this in the next slides. What do I mean by that? Why is it important? And he provides a very nice way to think about it is you tend to multiply the creative thinkings which you have in terms of reaching the customers conveying the promotional aspects of your brands, talking about the specific attributes and the price points of your products in a creative manner. And that kind of multiplies with the strategic multi marketing challenges which you have. So, so to speak, the agency trusted partnership with the company can and is inoculating some amount of negative effect which the pandemic has caused on business outcomes. There is evidence to it. So first is to find the partnership and the outsourcing seems to be really working out. Now, how do we find a trusted partner? After we find a trusted partner, what do we do with those? And how do we manage and organize this social media partnership is going to be my next few slides. The second important thing I say is what I call meld. Now meld yourself into this social media agency. No more you're going to treat the social media agency as some kind of an outsourced market research partner. Guess what? This is my goal. Please go ahead and collect some data, follow the steps and give it back to me. That's exactly what I'm saying you should not do. You deeply integrate your marketing strategy with the social media activities. How do we do it? Follow these simple steps. First, once you develop a trusted relationship with the social media partner, invite the senior executives of those agencies to sit on your critical brand and marketing meetings. They should be part of your marketing strategy meetings. Second, create an extraordinary communication through the agency with the customer. This is what we call leapfrogging or business to business customers are taken care of. For that, you might have to build new capabilities. Some of it will be brought by the agency and the partnership, but maybe some of it you need to necessarily hire for it. Trust me, this is an investment, not a cost. In the long term, the future is going to be the digital world, at least for the next two years. Therefore, it's imperative that you build communication platform with the customer through the partner agency integrate the partner agency with not just your marketing actions, but with the communication platform as well. Finally, please make sure you onboard your social media partner into the culture of trust-based relationship. Again, it's not simply outsourcing the deal like a market agency. Hey, do you like this? Go talk to potential customer. Do you like my product I give? What do you think about my product? That's exactly what we are not saying. Trust and integrity are as important as the product expertise and the brand's expertise or the functional component of what the company stands for. So second message after you build a partnership is MELD. Integrate partner with your social media partner. 
Finally, most important in my mind, which is where companies like Smart Printer are just leading the uh, uh, competitive battle, is metrics, metrics, metrics. Why metrics are important? You have to measure what you're trying to do. Once you measure, then only you can monitor. If at all you monitor, then only you can manage it. Remember I said managing and organizing the social media partner is the catch and what comes to your help here is the data. What type of metrics to follow? Just few things. First, surprising aspect, you might feel a little uh, touchy about it, but let me try to build my arguments for it. First, level of integration between your firm and the social media partner that itself need to be measured. Why? I work with the company, I cannot disclose the name of it, and they came back and said, Arun, you know what? The customer found out that it was the agency which sent out this message in the last two, three weeks, and they're a little sad about it. So you don't want these things to happen. So you have to make sure that you are nicely integrated with the agency so that the customer in the marketplace does not think, okay, this is like a polishing act by the firm. No, this is a well thought through act of providing proper customer engagement. So for that, you need to make sure you measure the level of integration with the social media partner. The second is the bread and butter of marketing, which is customer metrics. That's the gold standard. What do you need to measure? How well my brand has spread in terms of the intended targeted market space. Second, how many customers am I retaining them? What's the lifetime value of it? You do not have to break yourself, knock yourself off with sophisticated models. Even simple recency, frequency, monetary value to measure the retention of customers is much more sufficient at this time. Acquire, how many new customers you acquired? In fact, my own B2B research, which just recently got published, say that you monitoring and measuring and managing number of new customers acquired through different digital platforms are very important. Finally, this is an interesting aspect, which goes back to the story which I just mentioned. You cannot put your social media partner in autopilot. There's no two way about it. You don't say, I don't set it and then forget about it. There's no, no way about it. There's no second way to hard work. The agency is going to be the voice of your customer. So periodically get feedback from the social media partners or your digital partners. So three things, how well you're integrated, what type of customers you have managed, metrics you are measuring, and finally, What's the feedback? How, what is the market talking about your company's brand, your company's product? So that's, so these are the three things which I recommend in terms of managing the social media. Partnership, melding, metrics. Next, let me go to the marketplace. Now, what is the customer thinking here? How are brands imprinted in the customer's mind? And the CBM team also requested me, I can take a small detour in talking about B2C space as well. So I'll finish off in the next slide with that aspect. Very interestingly, research shows that brands which are being responsive during customer, during these, excuse me, recession times have a positive effect on futuristic performance. What do I mean by responsive? Just listen to the customer's problem and try to communicate the best way possible. So that gives a lot of confidence in the customer's mind. And the most studied concept in marketing after customer satisfaction is something called customer confidence index. You can easily take a guess, my friends. Customer confidence index during recession time is absolutely negative. So once you start to listen and communicate and empathize with the customer, their confidence level goes up. So that's like giving a protective coat to your customer. Those brands which master the art of empathizing with not only the external customers, but their internal employees. What pro-social behaviors they are doing to make sure their employees are well protected at the same time, trying to empathize with the customer problems and trying to come up with some novel solution, however micro it might be. This is absolutely essential. You never want to be commercially exploitative at this point of time. Empathy, empathy, empathy. That's the key word. And most importantly, as I told you before, customers will find out if you're just going to do a polishing behavior 
and are not being genuinely empathizing with their problems and trying to communicate. Second counterintuitive things, and I will put it in the chat box, a wealth of information on this particular aspect, which I call repurposing your marketing resources. What do I mean to say here is, ABN Herb, which is the leading beer manufacturers, they said, boss, I cannot do much on sports investment. NFL, NBA in the US has taken a big hit. So what do I do with these resources? I can sit with the cash and enjoy that, or I can do something the following, which is try to use those resources, however partially, to help the frontline heroes who are actually fighting for our welfare. The moment they did it, and they communicated it genuinely that the brand ABNB stands for pro-social behavior and does two or three things for the frontline heroes, customers gave them brownie points. They came back to them, they were loyal, they did not move away from the brands. This is very important when I talk about the problems which existing big brands face at the time of crisis. And how do you hold on to it? Repurpose your marketing resources, repurpose your brand images. Now I'll share a wealth of information in terms of an Excel sheet, giving you 137 examples to be precise of how brands like Coca-Cola, Mahindra, Nike repurposed their marketing resources for genuine social cause. And finally, Edelman is one of the famous uh, and big studies which is done, it clearly says that 90% of the respondents want the brands to do everything for the well-being of both internal, which is employee stakeholders, and the external stakeholders, despite the brand's activities might for the time being cause a financial loss for them. Because in the long term, these are the customers who are going to stick with you for a longer period of time. A quick detour on opportunity for B2C before I hand it over to my friend, uh, Mr. Shiladitya Malik. Now, interesting things are, is consumers in, in terms of packaged goods or beverages and household product buyers, they are cognitive misers. What do I mean by that? So they always have heuristics and shortcuts. This is the way I do decisions. And that type of shortcut-based decisions form habit Habits are really, really strong, my friends. It's a very hard nut to crack. Now, therefore, now small brands, imagine you're a small brand and you're not known in private label or something. Now, if you have a habit of buying particular type of brands, uh, in normal times, that's the problem which small brands have. How do you break this? But this is not normal time. This is new normal. In this time, what is the customer doing? She is reducing the frequency of visit or purchase and actually increasing every time purchase in the basket size. The customer, she is actually buying and willing to buy and experiment more brands, a staggering 50% new brands in regular purchases of consumer products are she by date. So therefore, in terms of consumer business, the mantra is the following. You not only have to be purely functional, that is, that's the product, that's the job it intended to have to, but also be again pro-social in terms of how you're taking care. Classic examples are Life Boys and many other companies, Unilever's uh, Life Boys, so how they took care of this hand wash uh, and how it can help. Uh, and then Unilever's uh, Signal, Signal is the pepsodent in India toothpaste. Uh, they took care of something called school students' absentism by promoting how oral health care is absolutely important. So I will leave it there because I don't want to take more time, but I've covered some bit of it. So let me stop here and hand it over to Sheila Ditya. Sheila Ditya, please. Hey, thanks a lot, Professor Arun. Shall I stop sharing now? Yes, please. And if okay, you can... I'm passing on the presenter privileges to you, Mr. Malik. Yes. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Professor Arun, for this great insight, uh, which is research backed in terms of what we can do uh, today on the marketing front to uh, come out of this pandemic in the best way possible. Uh, what I'm going to spend some time today to, is to talk about uh, remote selling. Now, remote selling is something which has uh, kind of, you know, crept into our consciousness over the past four months 
face to face selling is going down and remote selling is coming up but there's a lot of myths you know how do we kind of position our sales team how do we ensure that they have the right skills and capabilities so i'm going to also provide you with a framework which you can use and uh, obviously for from a business to business perspective you need to customize it but i think that could be a good starting point uh, in terms of understanding what you need to do to ensure that your sales team can effectively sell in the remote first world so the first question what we want to ask is that what are some of the top challenges in remote selling so we did a survey of uh, you know smart winner uh, frontline sales people who have transitioned uh, successfully from frontline uh, face to face selling to remote selling and we asked them this question what are some of the top sales uh, you know remote selling challenges and these are the responses uh, in not uh, top responses in not uh, any order of importance but the first thing they were saying is that not getting the right content to engage with the customer very interesting not getting the right content now in a face to face selling situation we have to understand that if you have an appointment for 15 minutes or 30 minutes you own that time of the customer right so you can pace it you have the content you can answer the question but in remote sales what's happening is your sales process is broken down into multiple touch points so it might start with uh, you know a uh, email it might go into a zoom call then you know the customer might ask you a couple of questions in whatsapp so there is a continuous shift in the touch points right and you need to have the right content to uh, to respond to the customer in the right sales context right and we are still seeing that organizations are struggling in providing this uh, right content to the customer so that's number one second it's also difficult to uncover the customer need so when you are doing a face to face selling obviously you you will be getting the you know visual cues the uh, non verbal cues but more so uh, also you know from the uh, physical act of going and meeting a customer so if it's a direct to home sales you are going and meeting a customer you can see what's the uh, you know uh, is it a bike standing out of the uh, uh, gate or it's a car or is it a you know luxury car you can make certain judgment on the socio economic uh, you know uh, uh, level of the customer and hence you can uh, decide uh, you know what your pitch should be so these things are obviously totally not possible uh, in the remote sales scenario but what you can do today is that especially in the b2b sales uh, space you can definitely do a lot of research uh, about the customer what their likes and dislikes are you know uh, and and uh, you can follow, see their linkedin profile and uh, make some educated guess so you have to do some sort of you know guess work on this uh, area the third is lack of motivation working from home this is very very interesting and counter intuitive because when the pandemic hit all of us thought that okay working from home great so we are going to do much better but it seems that the data speaks otherwise especially our research shows that the bottom 50% of the sales team not your top performers the bottom 50% of your sales team they actually struggle more in terms of finding the right set of motivation to work from uh, you know sell effectively remotely and working from home that is primarily because this is the segment of your sales team who needs more guidance from the managers and companies are still figuring out you know what should be the process what should be the protocol what should be the right balance in terms of you know giving them the uh, right set of guidance but also not uh, you know do a lot of micromanagement the next one is you know difficult to sustain a conversation as i said that if you are having a whatsapp chat uh, with a uh, customer the customer is in control but if you are in a face to face selling situation you are in control so you really need to have the skill set to continue a conversation you really need to have the knowledge to continue the uh, conversation you really need to have the content to continue this conversation so that is a new behavior which the sales teams are finding really really difficult and finally not having digital tools again it can be something as simple as you know not having access to internet or maybe the network is poor where he is uh, working out from or uh, you know there is no company issued laptop or they don't have the right crm system or the sales enablement system so there could be an entire spectrum of you know such such issues but all of us uh, we realize that uh, this new normal of remote selling that is that is going to stay uh, for the foreseeable future and companies must invest in the right set of digital tools in the right set of digital infrastructure to ensure that the sales team they are uh, they can actually sell very free and as far as the uh, you know technology and the infrastructure is concerned uh, there is nothing amiss on on the uh, on their part right See, these are some of the top skills challenges in the remote first era so the next question is what kind of skills do we need to have to effectively sell in 
this uh, uh, remote selling situation. So the first thing, obviously, is conversational skills. And uh, previously, in a face-to-face -face meeting, you could have, you know, gone for a coffee and you can have the chit chat. Now, you know, it's difficult. So you have to do your homework, and it's a new set of skills which people need to master. Second, active listening skills. Again, you, you know, what happens that if you're doing a sale, uh, sales over a Zoom call and the customer switches off the video, so you're not getting any visual clue. So you have to really, really fine tune your antenna to see that what kind of, uh, you know, uh, vocal clues are coming, especially if it's like, you know, initial sales or some pricing negotiation which are happening. So you have to really be attentive listener. Third, and this I would say is the most important professor also talked about is, uh, is building trust. Right. This is a time where you know, trust is in short supply. So how do you build trust? Uh, again, when we meet someone face to face, it's easier to build that trust. Uh, in remote selling, we see a new pattern emerging. The fact is that the sales process is broken down into multiple you know, short engagements. Right? It could be a uh, video call. It could be a WhatsApp. It could be some set of emails. So you have to be uh, your consistent true self, and you have to represent the uh, you know, company in the right way so that trust building is done. But again, that's a skill which needs to be mastered. On-screen presence, again, this might seem to be a very hygiene factor, but the fact is that you, know, you are doing a video call and your uh, you know, background is very messy or you're doing work from home and you're just in a t-shirt and the client is expecting a professional appearance. So there needs to be processes and policies and training and awareness on you know, what should be the right way to do that. Presentation and written communication. I know a salesperson, you know, an excellent salesperson, excellent, uh, you know, in convincing any customer on a face-to-face -face situation, but he's really struggling today uh, in, you know, trying to sell uh, his services over WhatsApp or over chat or over email because that has never been his forte. So he is a great orator, right? So you have to identify maybe some of your top salespeople, you know, they need to uh, uh, get this skill, right? So you, the company needs to also empathize with the sales team and they need to you know provide the right set of uh, support uh, to to develop this particular skill set and finally prof also talked about it is empathy driven sales the times are tough we are going through a tough situation the customers they are also going through a tough situation how do you behave with your customer how do you empathize with him what kind of brand messaging you are actually portraying that becomes very very critical and this is one place empathy driven sales which uh, you know has to be driven by the top management that's number one and number two is that this is something which uh, you know you uh, you need to re really do it constantly so it's a change in mindset it's a change in culture for the organization this is a very interesting study which has been done by the OMG group. So they actually uh, evaluated uh, 61,000 sales professional on some of the skill sets I talk, just talked about. Uh, and what they found was very interesting. They put that evaluation data and correlated it with the data of the performance of the sales team. So what they found was that out of the elite sales people, so the top 5% performers in your organization, only two-thirds, 67% people, they had the skill set what we were talking in the uh, slide before, right? By the way, some, you know, some of you might be saying that, you know, the skills which we were talking about before, that's actually, it should be, uh, you know, there in all sales reps. Yes, that's true. But in the pre-pandemic era, you could be a great orator, you could not have, you know, good communication skill, you would still go by. But in the uh, current scenario, these skills are no longer optional, these are mandatory. So that's the important difference, right? So what they found was that, you know, the top 5%, they only two thirds of them have the right skill. And if you go down, you see even more interesting data, the bottom 50%, only one third of the salespeople, they have the right skills to sell it effectively in the market in a remote first world. Now, what does it mean for you? It's both good news and bad news, right? The bad news is probably the same statistics is true for your own organization as well. But the good news is that your, your competitors, they are also on the same boat, which means if you can you know, invest on the right set of processes, if you can invest on the you know, right set of uh, training and development, so probably you can leapfrog your competition and you can enable your sales team to successfully sell in the remote, remote first world. So how do you kind of, you know, enable your sales team to be successful? And in our experience, it's not one or two things, but you need to have alignment on three things. You need to have the right content strategy. You need to have the right training strategy. And you need to have the right incentive strategy. So 
So I'll very briefly kind of focus on uh, these things. So let's talk about the content strategy. So the driving force behind the content strategy, you have to always think about this, that the customer's attention span on the digital space is much less compared to their attention span on a physical space. I repeat, when you are having a digital engagement with the customer, his attention span is much less compared to when you have a face-to-face -face or physical engagement with the customer. Now, often what we see is companies, they kind of, you know, have their physical collaterals, maybe their sales brochures, and they just digitize it, and they think, okay, now we have got a digital strategy, now we have got a digital content. No. So you first need to kind of do a content audit of your entire content which you have, and you have to think about, okay, if we have got our different product lines, so what is the sales playbook which is going to look for each of these product lines? What are the top FAQs? What are the typical objections? What are the typical uh, you know, competitive products which are there, right? So you need to kind of analyze all your product lines from a sales content playbook perspective, and then you really need to rethink your content and you need to recreate your content in bite-sized consumable content, right? It could be infographics, it could be videos, and why do I say bite-sized? So if you see, uh, you know, the optimal size of a, a video in Facebook for maximum engagement is two minutes. So if a video is more than two minutes, there is a sharp drop in the engagement level of that particular video. In Twitter, you cannot even upload a video longer than two minutes, 20 seconds. Why? Obviously, they have done a lot of study and they have figured out two minutes, 20 seconds is the you know, maximum where you can push uh, the attention span for today's generation where our attention is very, very fragmented and fractured, right? So you have to rethink and you have to understand the, the consumer or the B2B buyer even whose behavior while surfing Twitter or Facebook, it would be the same behavior when they are consuming your content. So you have to mold your content according to the buyer's digital engagement level rather than the other way around, right? Then multimodal content. So you have to think about, uh, okay, if it's a, a pharmaceutical company, so you know, can we create some, uh, say, peer-to-peer -peer, um, learning session? Can we create a, uh, you know, a, a, a conference or a, a webinar on a protocol for uh, treating this drug? Can we follow it up with our own product brochure? So there will not be a single mode, or only I am doing webinar, or only I am sending content. So it has to be a multimodal approach, which needs to be done. And finally, the good thing is that in a digital first world, you can measure and you can optimize, right? So previously, uh, you know, if you're sharing just, a, for example, again, to take a pharma example, if an MRI is going and visiting the doctor and, you know, doing a physical detailing, now with the e-detailing, you know, physical detailing, you really don't know how much time is spent on which of the sections of the brochure, uh, but, you know, uh, e-detailing, you definitely will be able to see that, okay, the doctors are more important, interested in the, the clinical trial information or maybe the safety information, right? So you can take all this insight and you can feed back to your content audit so that there is a continuous improvement of your content plan. And this is a laborious process. I will not say that this is a very easy process. This is a painstaking and laborious process. But if you do this successfully, this could be a very strong competitive advantage compared to your uh, competitors, right? And here, when we talk about you know, making this into reality, one thing what we need to think about is that we need to work along with the marketing team. So the sales team alone cannot do it, right? So we are seeing a, you know, many instances where companies are creating this cross-functional SWAT team. So they have you know, people from the sales team, people from the marketing team, some folks from the IT team, all of them working together because these are not uh, you know, normal times, these are uh, extraordinary times. So you really need to create this kind of you know, work groups to uh, very quickly uh, turn around and create your content, right? And then the last thing is that even if you have the greatest and the best content, if the contents, uh, contents are not easily discoverable, if the contents are not easily searchable, if the contents are not easily shareable, then all of your investment will go down the drain, right? So you really need to focus on uh, you know, having the right platform so that these con contents are easily discoverable, searchable, and shareable to get the best ROI. Now, once we have fixed our content strategy, so we are empowering our sales team with the right content, next, we are saying that, okay, how can we now help them to you know, upskill themselves in the new reality? And then the focus area will be enabling for the right knowledge, the right skill, and the right attitude, right? So again, we see a lot of the time, you know, what 
um, uh, customers sometimes do is that they would be having see a three hour long um, you know face to face uh, program training program maybe a you know induction program they will record it and they will upload this three hour long program and they will say now the program is digitized please learn your own i would like to ask you a question would you watch a three hour long movie i think most of us will not right so a movie which is purely for made for entertainment even if that is three hour long we are not going to watch it in a digital channel right Similarly, they are not going to engage. They are not going to kind of imbibe the knowledge from a three-hour long training program. So you have to rethink the way you need to kind of, you know, uh, look at your uh, program structure, right? So you need shorter sessions. So a two-day long program can, uh, in the physical world, needs to be broken down into a two-week long program instead of like eight hours in two, eight, eight, sixteen hours in two days. You need to probably do a two-hour session every day because that's the most we can take. Uh, in the digital world right you have to think about blended learning you know <clears throat> excuse me you have live sessions but you also need to have certain you know pre training activities post training activities and finally in the digital world engagement is the key right just the way when we are interacting with the customer in the digital world they can switch off at any time and we don't have any record so our sales team can also switch off if we can't make it engaging so we really, we really need to kind of work on making it in engaging and then what are the skills we are talking about right uh, video and audio digital role plays absolutely essential if i want to train my team uh, to sell over zoom right we need to kind of train them so we need to have a digital way of doing these uh, uh, you know uh, role plays we need to have virtual coaching because face to face uh, you know coaching on the field is not happening we need to have virtual coaching right so this is becoming very very critical for you know uh, insurance companies pharmaceutical companies who have field sales uh, but face to face meeting or the geographical separation is now too far uh, for us to do this uh, in in real time right so that's number one then training on you know finding facial cues the right questions to ask you know what is the anatomy of a, a sale on the digital world all of them needs to be trained to them right and then focusing on changing behavior as i said someone might be a great orator but now he has to do a you know a digital selling or a written communication based selling so it's a change in behavior which means you need to do regular digital reinforcements in order to drive this behavior so this cannot be a you know one training and people are transformed and everything is well that's not going to happen so you have to you know keep it focused and do it regularly and finally incentives and motivation strategies again the times are not the best people are confused people are scared people don't know uh, you know what's going to happen tomorrow so you really need to think about your incentive and motivation strategies uh, what we are seeing is that gamification is slowly complementing a lot of traditional incentive structure uh, just to make it you know more interesting and exciting for the sales team what we are seeing that there is a focus on activity driven selling there is a focus on you know uh, rewarding people on the different sales activities rather than only on the outcome so we can all always you know create a incentive plan which is only focused on the outcome and probably that's going to work very well if everything is under the control of the sales team but now today everything is not under the control of the sales team the market itself might tank right but what they can control they can control their sales activities you have to rethink of your strategy and you might want to say that okay i'm going to also reward the sales team on certain sales activities if we want to promote for example you know whatsapp based selling so every time you you know close a deal over whatsapp you get 100 points or you know a certain bonus or uh, every time you you know make a deal close over zoom i'm going to give you certain incentive so you have to align the incentive with the new way of selling right and then we are also seeing that you know you can also reward people digitally so you have to now think about you know hard versus soft incentives people are not meeting face to face so sometimes you have to socially recognize people you have to think about this you know soft incentives uh, much more than what you were doing maybe 6 months before and finally you have to make it fun and you have to make it engaging you have to, you can create you know something like a virtual sales ipl contest video pitch contest uh, you know uh, work from home warrior league so there has to be a story there has to be a mission so you need to align the entire sales team on that story and on that mission so that's what we need to do uh, in order to ensure that we have a right content strategy we have the right uh, training strategy and we have the right incentive or motivation strategy all of them aligned to ensure that the sales team can sell as effectively as they can at this point of time i will stop and i'll hand it over to anindita who is going to take us through uh, 
one specific case study um, of how you can bring all of them together uh, into your um, you know, uh, sales enablement plan. So over to you, Anindita. Uh, thanks, Shiladitya. So let me just start my screen share for a moment. Okay, there it is. Okay. So everyone, a very good evening to you. I know this is a Friday evening. Your family must be waiting for you to wrap up. So I won't keep you more than 15 minutes. Uh, we are having a very engaging session with uh, Professor Arunachalam talking about the social media strategy. Malik talking about a lot on you know, virtual selling, uh, your incentive strategy. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about a real case, a real scenario that has happened um, that we implemented. And I'm going to tell you about the fantastic outcome that has come out of it. I read your questions on motivation, on what sort of uh, selling strategy to use during these times. So I will try to incorporate all of that into the story and let's see how it goes. So let's start. So this story is about a life insurance company. It's a true case study that we had done. So it's a life insurance company with 12,000 agents, what we know as the agent advisors. So what happened to this company when this pandemic started and the lockdown started happening? So the lockdowns happened, the bank insurance channel started to shut down because no people were visiting the branch, the bank branches where the bank insurance channel starts. So sales started to go down there. That was the first. The second was, um, you know what happens in traditional sales in an insurance company, right? You have these insurance agents who will call you up, who will tell you, sir, can I, you know, can I fix an appointment? Can I come and visit you? Maybe it does you know, 11 o'clock on Saturday morning sound good to you? So you say yes, and they come over and they have the conversation. What has started to happen during this pandemic was no face-to-face -face conversations were happening. So sales started to go down there as well. So with these kind of challenges in mind, they approached us. These are the four problem statements they came to us with. Find new ways to boost sales during this pandemic as well as after the pandemic. With face-to-face -face meetings being very, very less frequent, how do our agents sell at all? We did understand that virtual selling was the way to go, you know, selling over phone, over WhatsApp, over Zoom, but they were finding it extremely difficult to train the agents in this new way of virtual selling. So how do they do that quickly and efficiently? And most importantly, which I'm sure most of you, you know, you are focusing on is how do we meet our targets in these difficult times? So very pertinent. And I'm going to take you through a journey that we took them through the six step process. So we give them a six step approach for sales excellence during this pandemic. There are six steps to it. We are going to touch upon them briefly, and then we are going to go do a deep dive through each of these steps. So we started off with the product portfolio. Take a look at the product portfolio to understand whether there were any products that had to be repositioned because of this new and emerging marketing needs. Channel. Of course, as we all know, remote emerged to be one of the most successful ways to sell during this pandemic, and even it continues to do that. But having remote as a way to sell also brought in a new challenge in terms of the selling script. What the agents were using to sell when they were doing a face-to-face -face with a conversation with the customer now has to become entirely different when they're talking to the customer on the phone. So your scripts are changing. With changing scripts, it also means that the agent's knowledge have to be very, very perfect. You have to sound very confident. You should be able to answer every question right away. Imagine if you're talking to an agent, you ask a question and the agent then says, um, okay, sir, let me get back to you. I have to check a few things. You would feel very confident about giving the deal to that agent, would you? So knowledge is paramount, which led to what were the different trading strategies that they could use to drive the new selling script, to drive knowledge amongst the agents. And something that has been worrying most of us since this pandemic started. How do we keep our sales teams motivated to sell? So these are the six areas that we give them solutions on. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go deeper into each of these areas, and I hope you will get a lot of takeaways from that. So we're going to first start off, step one. 
the product portfolio. So this is an insurance company that I'm talking about. So with the shifting um, market, what we could understand that there was a change from savings to the risk products. People were more akin to buying a risk product than a savings product. There were a lot of focus on renewal of existing premiums, but there's a catch there. Imagine if an agent calls up a customer and says, you know, sir, your uh, premium is coming for renewal, please renew it. That is perhaps not the best statement to give to a customer, right? These are difficult times. People are actually losing their jobs. So your statement changes to what? Sir, I know these are difficult times, but continuing your coverage is extremely crucial because of such bad circumstances. See how you are repositioning the same statement. Then of course, we thought about what are the different new products that, were, uh, that could become more important in the emerging needs of this market. Now, what I would like to do is, I know I'm talking about a life insurance company, and I know that most of you might not be from the life insurance world. So what I would like you to do is take this as a takeaway, as food for thought, think about it with respect to your business, your market. I'm sure you have already taken a relook at your product portfolio, right? If you haven't, please do that. See if you can reposition an existing product in the mind of your customer. I'll give you a very interesting, another example here. We work with a pharma company, a pharmaceutical company, uh, who has a zinc supplement product. Before the pandemic, it was getting sold the way normally zinc supplements got sold. But after the pandemic started, they changed the statement which the medical reps were telling the doctors. What did it become? Sir, as you know, you know the zinc supplement, as you know, zinc helps in improving the immunity of a patient. So this zinc supplement that we have, you could prescribe them to your patients because immunity has suddenly become much, much more important than ever before. See what they did? They took their existing product, they just changed the sales statement that they're making to their customers. See if you can do that, think about it. Moving on to step two, where we talk about the channel. Remote has emerged to be the channel through which all sales are happening. And of course, this company realized that. WhatsApp, Zoom, Microsoft Teams increasingly became important. But imagine the scenario. Uh, this is an agent who is calling you. You know, consider me to be a, uh, an insurance agent. I'm calling you, you're my customer. And I say, um, sir, madam, you know, uh, is it okay if we had a call maybe on Saturday at around 11 o'clock in the morning? Will you be available? And then you say, yes, of course, why not? Give me a call then. And then you say, as a customer, Hey, um, Anandita, do you mind sending some information to me before the call? I would just like to take a look before I get into this call with you. See what they did here? They're asking for more information from you. And this is exactly what Malik, oh sorry, Shiladitya was talking about, your digital content. So in this company, what they did was, the marketing team sat down with the sales team. They completely revamped their uh, content, their product brochures. They made it much more relevant to the customer. So a food for thought for you when you're thinking about a remote channel of sales is if remote channel is important to you, are you thinking of using it or how are you thinking of using it? So this um, company that we work with, a medical devices company. So when the pandemic started, the sales trips were not able to visit the hospitals. They could not get into the cat labs or into the operation theaters. So what did they do to keep their HCPs and their KOLs engaged? They actually created a virtual training academy. What happened to that virtual training academy? They brought in experts from all over the world. And then they started doing video sessions on certain procedures that are extremely difficult. The experts were giving their opinion, their experience. There was a lot of engagement that was happening. So that's a very good way to engage your customers, deliver value. Think about what changes that will need in your process in the existing trainings and you know, the structures that you already have. So this is a food for thought, food for thought for you. Moving on to the set, step three. Now that you know that you know, remote channel is the way to go, your selling script changes. You cannot use the same script that the agent was using when they were having a face-to-face -face conversation. It needs to be empathy-based. There has to be a completely revamped digital content that we discussed before. 
So when you're redrafting the sales pitch, what is it that you need to think about? You need to think about that the customer has already done his research. The agent is not getting any visual cues when they are on the phone. It's listening skills. The listening skills suddenly have to become really, really good. The metaverbal skills have to become excellent. The selling script has to be de delivered in just the perfect manner. So there was a lot of these selling script changes that this company did. They actually completely revamped their selling script. Now the question for you, how this can become relevant to you is, think about it. Does your selling script also need to change? Are you speaking, let's say in the pharma world, um, how are you converting your personal touch to a virtual touch? Are your medical reps calling up the doctors and adding value? Next is, are your collaterals redesigned for remote setting? So you cannot just simply take up your clinical paper and then send it to the doctor. Maybe you need to make some changes to it, make it beautify it, make it easy for them to read, do something so that it becomes much more relevant to your end customer. With that, I move on to the step four. So what have we covered till now? You know which products to focus on. Second, you know that you want to use remote selling. Third, you, want, you have already changed your selling script. Now comes the most important part. How do you get your sales teams to deliver? Do they have the right knowledge? So what this life insurance company did, they sent one micro-learning feed daily. What does micro-learning feed mean? Very simple, nothing complicated. You take top three USP, USPs of your product. You talk about what are the features, advantages, benefits of your product. What is this helping the sales reps to do? It's you're giving constant reinforcement of information. Same information being repeated over and over again. So what does neuroscience tell us? That if I see a piece of information over a period of time, then my recall will increase. That's what you're doing. You're helping your sales teams to remember crucial information. You could also send certain motivational bites, like some leadership talk. You can get, you can have your MD of your company send out a Monday motivation message, right? You could give out remote selling tips. Very interesting to the salespeople. They get it on their, you know, on their mobile devices. It's easy for them to access. The next thing that they did was they sent out five questions on new products, on existing products to their sales teams. So it would be open from nine o'clock in the morning to six o'clock in the evening. So they, how much time do you need? About 30 seconds to answer five questions, five multiple choice questions, of course. And what this enabled them to do, it enabled them to retain that information. So we're talking about regular exposure and we're talking about retaining that information. So all of this together increased their product knowledge, which all of us know is extremely important to sell. So for you, think about what are the different training strategies that you're using right now? You're, I'm sure your trainers are working overtime. They're working extremely hard to give um, you know, sessions over Zoom, over Microsoft Teams. But what are you doing about reinforcement? We all want our sales teams to be extremely action-oriented. Are they translating what they're learning into action? That's a food for thought for you. And finally, the, you know, the interesting part, you have a new selling script. How are you getting your sales team to stick to the selling script? And how do you know that selling script works? So this is something that this life insurance company did. So they sent out you know, a weekly, every week they send out one remote video coaching assignment. What does that mean? It means that take up one scenario. For example, record a two minute video of this new life insurance Jeevan Bhima product when you are introducing it to a customer on the phone. So once you send this assignment out, the agents are expected to record videos on their phones. Now, when you're recording a video, you try it yourself. If you're recording a video, you're going to take at least five to six retakes of that video. Videos are extremely brutal. You will take a video, you will review it. You will say, hey, I missed that point. I need to do this again. What, are, what did they make them do? The beauty of the solution is they were actually practicing. And that's exactly what you want them to do. So after practicing, they say that, okay, this is the best video that I have recorded and I sent it, send it to my manager for, him, for his feedback as well as the trainer for his feedback. The manager's trainers give positive feedback, the cycle continues and the agents improve a lot on, the remote, on, on this uh, setting script. 
The other thing that they did was they circulated the best videos. What this helped to do was peer learning happened, which is very important in sales. So this, this is a very interesting way where you, the selling script was practiced and it was, it just, you know, it was as if embedded into the DNA of every sales agent. So question for you in, in your team, I'm guessing, you know, you have a sales team. So in your team, how do you ensure that each person gives out a uniform message to your customers? How do you ensure that the price objection handling is happening exactly the way you want it to happen? Food for thought, think about it. If not, you could use the same procedure to drive objection handling, introducing a new product, and it's, it's not necessarily on the phone. It could be on a video call, it could be on different ways. Now, now at the beginning of this call, I did promise you a concrete plan, and here it is. So we bring everything together. We brought everything together under what we call the activity-driven sales. So let me, you know, this is a lot of information, but let me walk you through it. So if you, if I can bring your attention to each of these rows here. So what we're saying is it was a three month plan. It was break, broken down into what we call monthly missions and weekly missions. So here you can see, so first is, first two are on training. So every time, every day, they get five questions to, un to answer. Two points for each correct answer. One remote video coaching comes in to their feed that they need to complete every week, 100 points, because it takes a lot of dedication and time to uh, submit a video coaching. So that's your training aspect. The next is what we call the input-driven sales. They're trying out a new channel. So you need to help them understand that, okay, there are new steps to this process. So get your customer referrals. Every customer referral gives you 20 points. Do the customer calls. Every call gives you 10 points. So you're helping them understand that input activities are also as important as your ultimate outcome. The next two are, of course, on the ultimate outcome. Now, this is a very simplified version that I'm showing you. The actual plan was an Excel sheet that had 50 rows to it. There can be various variations to this. It can be extremely complicated depending on the size of your product portfolio, portfolio depending on what, is, what, are, what are the KPIs that you would like to track. Here they took one high margin product, one high volume product. They wanted to increase the sale of this high margin LI product. So they gave out 100 points for each. But at the same time, they still wanted to make sure that the high volume product was also rolling. So 50 points for that. And most importantly, so that people are really excited to sell over Zoom, 50 additional points for any sale that you close on Zoom. See what they did? They just took, they took everything together, put a point system on it, and created a structure. And you have an extremely exciting game. Now, how did that happen? We were talking about motivation. So I'd like to introduce you to the Summer Sales IPL 2020. IPL, everyone knows about it. Everyone is excited when IPL starts. So there were hundreds of teams that were created. They got their own names, their own logos. See some of these examples I've given here. Could, didn't have the space for so many teams, but I'm trying to show you how it actually looks like. So, Every agent belongs to some team. There were points that were getting awarded for every application sold, every customer call that is happening, additional points for higher margin products, for closing the sales over Zoom. All these points were coming together and in a leaderboard like this, which was automatically getting generated. One month into this game, so as I told you, this was a three month plan. One month into this game, we introduced the throwdowns. See, agent versus agent and team versus team throwdowns. You ask what that is, think of it this way. Team Karnataka versus Team Mumbai. Team Delhi versus Team Tamil Nadu. What is this throwdown on? The total number of applications. So the number of the team that sells the maximum number of applications wins the throwdown. Same thing for agent versus agent. I cannot even tell you the amount of excitement, the amount of encouragement that went around. It was a vibrant environment. So this really, really got them a spike in their sales. What we also encourage them to do is to celebrate every single win. We are, we are in despondent times. People need to celebrate. So there were winners that were announced every week. How did that help? 
as an agent, I thought that, okay, I didn't win this week, but I definitely have the possibility of winning next week. Same for team winners. We also encourage them to share success stories. So when an agent closes a very difficult deal, he came and shared his success story over the chat. Everyone else comes and congratulates him. Um, managers uh, come and uh, do a like on their feed and you know, everyone is participating. It is very exciting. So after telling you about all of this, you know, things that we have done, the summer sales cycle 2020, I would like to tell you about the outcome. And this is outstanding. The productivity of the reps increased by 45%. Can you imagine under such circumstances? There was a 37% increase in sales via this virtual channel. They were tracking every sale via the channel. So one product, Life Insurance One, through your standard channel, through your remote channel, as well as through your online channel. They actually had an online channel as well. Retention was 26% higher than in normal times. And as we know in life insurance, in any insurance actually, agent retention is a challenge. 40% of the agents were able to go to a higher level of productivity during the game than ever before. So this is the outcome that they got in three months. They still have, you know, they still have another three months to go with the game. They have changed the structure a bit so that it reflects the times that we are in. But this is what I would like to tell you. I know that I've taken an example of a life insurance company, but sometimes it gets interesting to know what is working in other industries. Take, pick up best practices that might work for you as well. So you might be a sales manager, you might be a regional sales manager or the country head. Think about all the steps that we discussed today. Can you do a plan like this, which can take your sales to a whole different level? So with that, I hand it over to you, Professor Arun, for your closing comments. Thank you, Anindita. That was uh, terrific. I think uh, I, as a presenter, I myself shouldn't say this, but for one hour, I think we have uh, You've done a good job. I'm actually proud. So let me also add uh, to what Anindita just said. The pharmaceutical company which he was uh, talking of, uh, I was involved in the project as well. Uh, so uh, by this time, uh, I think we talked about it. Smart Winner uh, is founded by Shiladitya and Anindita, and Shila is uh, ISB alum. So uh, let me uh, talk proudly about what we achieved in the pharmaceutical company via Smart Winner is we implemented a very interesting contest. And uh, the sales which we got, the sales uplift we got through simple interventions uh, through technology uh, is almost close to 19.68 percentage in specific set of sales segments. And in across all the different salespeople segments which we did the contest, uh, easily we observed close to 6.9 percentage. So I'm reading the number actually from a different slide uh, from the research which we just finished uh, with the pharmaceutical company. So with that, uh, let me conclude. So I think uh, we have challenges in the pandemic, but nevertheless, uh, whether it's a business market or a consumer market, uh, technology has come to our aid. Now, how do we use technology is just the starting step. As Anindita really micromanaged every bit of the issue in terms of the script level. So how do you effectively utilize the technology is going to be the catch. And I feel uh, that uh, companies like uh, Smart Pinner, which are the digital partners, which I was talking about initially, uh, I was broadly uh, referring to digital partners, but I made the points specific to social media partners. I think they make a huge difference in terms of both training knowledge development and performance outputs. So while I am finishing, I request Asta and Meenal to put in the chat the contact details of uh, CBM, and I request uh, Shila Ditya also to put in the chat the contact details of uh, Smart Winner, uh, Anindita and yourself, uh, so that uh, uh, friends, uh, we would like to end by saying that the Center for Business Market is a very unique center. And I'm very closely associated with the center and also being the academic director of the Center for Innovation Entrepreneurship. Our focus is on impact driven results. 
And we achieve that by collaborating with wonderful companies like you. So feel free to reach out to any of us or all of us. And uh, uh, given that we are part of the ISV ecosystem, we here is both SmartWinner and me, and they are very closely associated with the CAE, the Center for Innovation and the CBM. Feel free to email us or through ASTA or whatever channel on any interesting challenges which you have for us, for which we hope we can come up with novel and implementable solutions. Thank you. Over to you, Asta. Thank you, Professor. And uh, so I would not take uh, more than a minute. I'd just like to thank our speakers today for taking time to share their research and practice based insights relevant to these turbulent times. I hope our participants have been able to get some insights or food for thought that they can implement in their workspace. I would also like to thank all our participants for joining today on Friday evening and engaging with our speakers. Wish you all a great weekend. Stay safe, stay well, and uh, good night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Thank Asta. you. Thanks Thank a lot, Prof. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, everyone. Bye, Sheila. Thank Bye -bye. you so much, Asta and Meenal, for getting this done in a seamless manner. Appreciate it. Thank you, Prof. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.